to Cloud and Clear, the podcast by SADA for innovative business leaders and technology enthusiasts, where we explore how Google Cloud is transforming the industry and what that means to you. Now, here's your host, Tony Safoyan. Really excited for this episode of Cloud and Clear. I have uh, a guest that I've been a big fan of ever since I saw him speak at a Google Cloud Summit in Atlanta. Uh, please welcome to Cloud and Clear, Franz Johansson, the founder and CEO of the Medici Group. Thank you very much, Tony. Good to be here. When I heard you speak at the summit, and we talked about this before, I go to a lot of these events, you go to a lot of these events. <laughs> uh, most of the content, the formal content on the stage, you know, some of it's interesting, but we're there to do other things like network and have side meetings. But I was so captured by your session that I've never heard anyone talk about the topic of uh, diversity, um, the way that you spoke about it. And it's stuck with me ever since. And we've had a several conversations. We ordered many of your books and passed them around the company. Um, and we're, we're working on a couple other things together. But before we talk about that, can you please tell us about your Extremely unique background. Thank you for for uh, opening up like that. I I, um, I did enjoy that event at the at the Cloud Summit, and um, you know I've been on the fact that I'm at this point doing this work right now has really been uh, years in the making. Um, I uh, I grew up quite different from uh, my my friends at the time. I my my mother is black and Cherokee. My dad is Swedish. Uh, and I grew up in Sweden and in the town I grew up in, except for my sister and my mother, you know, there's no one else in that town, uh, anywhere even close to my particular background. Uh, and it taught me something interesting because I could see in the interaction between my parents, uh, that they were at this sort of intersection of, of different, of their different cultural backgrounds of the different race, of countries, um, just how uh, productive and exciting it was as they were sort of building on each other's uh, concepts and ideas about food or about how to do something in particular. Whatever, whatever those things w was, it, it definitely felt like it was different because and more richer because they were able to to bring together two different uh, two different perspectives. And then I um, uh, and then I, I saw a similar phenomenon when I went to college. I started an interdisciplinary science magazine there called Catalyst, which is still around uh, all these years later. And, um, and, and the impetus of doing so was that I was noticing just how in increasingly interesting it could be when you could work sort of combining concepts from the different scientific domains at, this, uh, at my college. And so this magazine was meant to sort of facilitate that. And in the back of my mind, it struck me that there were probably similar underlying processes for both of these things. And then I had an opportunity to start a company. It was a, it was a healthcare company in, um, in Baltimore. It was based on my aunt's research. And she was the first black female tenure professor at Johns Hopkins, actually, university. Wow. Um, and, you know, her story was equally fascinating. And, 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 I, and, I, and I noticed there's one thing in particular I just kind of call out in this context, uh, particularly because of the era that we're in right now, um, you know, she, she had to, um, in order to be sort of, well, she felt to be successful in her research, she didn't just rely upon the, uh, the statistics um, uh, resources that the university brought her. Uh, to sort of work through the papers and the research and so on. She had her own statistician that she's kind of brought on by herself. Mm -hmm. When I asked her about why that was, she said that the cost for me, and my aunt is black, the cost for me, if I am wrong, is so much higher than for my colleagues that even if I'm relying on the, on the statistics department at Johns Hopkins, sometimes they make mistakes. And I wow. can't do that. And it, and it always it stuck with me because I'm I'm thinking about the the you know that's an additional burden right that you're sort of taking on and it's not noticed I, I I'm sure that it's 
basically no one that she talked to even knew that she did this, right? And so it's not obvious, even if you even if you are thinking about well, what are the what might be the additional burdens they have in a situation like this? And then I started a software company, and I started seeing what happened when I brought together uh, different uh, industries. And then eventually, I wrote a book called The Medici Effect, and and that book was uh, really exploring the theoretical idea that we have the best chance of breaking new ground if we're able to be diverse and inclusive, diverse in our backgrounds and inclusive in our teams. Uh, you know, so that book has since completely come to define my uh, my career. Uh, you know, started a company since then, a, a consulting firm uh, that we had for many years. And now we basically have launched a platform company, uh, really a product company that can scale this globally. It's very exciting times. When you talked about how long you've been on this uh, thesis, uh, the fact that it's been, you know, 14, 15 plus years. And in, in a lot of ways, you know, there's certain people that end up giving a certain contribution to the world that's shaped by their, their, their experience being so unique <laughs> that mm. very few people would have had the life experiences leading to um, formulating a whole mission, a whole life purpose, a whole career, a book on this topic way before I would say, uh, not only not way before it was trendy, way before oh, there was any level of awareness. So what's interesting is when I wrote the book, one of the, one of the guiding principles I had for it was that I, I didn't want to write the book based off of like my own personal experiences in it. And then when you read it, you can sort of see how that plays out. And the book, The Meditative Effect, is, has, uh, is really a, 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 a combination of case studies all over the world, looking at what drove innovation in these situations and scenarios, and the underlying research. And what I arrived at actually was just, it's not, I, I didn't, early drafts of this book had a lot of mathematics in it. Uh, and, I, and, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I basically got rid of most of it except for one key piece in the middle. But really this is a mathematical idea. It's, it's an idea of, of, of increasing the number of concepts combinations when you create ideas and, and then when you're executing, you have to do a similar thing. And it's, it's this notion that we have a hard time predicting exactly what the future holds for us. Um, and so, and so once you kind of buy into that, what I realized even back then that I stumbled upon was a fundamental idea. Like it should persist through time and fascinatingly, right? It is more relevant today than when it came out. This is the, this is the right. thing that's kind of blowing my mind. But today, what are we seeing? My God, are we talking about diversity and inclusion? We're talking about it in terms of people and backgrounds, but we're also talking about the notion of convergence, which is kind of diversity of fields and industries, right? We're seeing all these things emerging all, wherever we look. Um, you know, the intersection of fields and industries and cultures and backgrounds and demographics are a massive contributor to new innovation. Uh, and that's what the Medicine Effect basically predicted. That's what I'm blown away by. How, how, how far ahead and to what degree you are like on the right side of history. And I think, the more, yeah. <laughs> no, seriously, like it, it's like crystal ball, you know, situation. Cause that's so rare that it happens. I think that someone is so far ahead of, history in, 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 in an area that's so impactful, you know? And I think to your point, as we were talking earlier today, you were talking about how busy you are now. And um, I mean, in the midst of this pandemic, something happens that actually has happened a bunch of other times, which yeah. is a black man um, was murdered, you know? Yeah targeted in, in some ways and mistreated and, and, and lost his life due to uh, his race. And even though that's happened t dozens of times, it, it just what we've seen on the, in the press dozens of times, but it happens much more than oh, that. If you go back and look at all these songs from NWA and like way back, this is what they were talking about. At that time, people didn't have camera phones. 
So, so like the world is catching up to a a, uh, a description that was articulated through music. But anyway, yes. What was about this particular incident? Oh, yeah. That has started a wave of self awareness, an awakening, a renaissance, and talking about the subject that. Um, People who are not black didn't talk about much, actually, in in a meaningful way. Let me just first um, amplify your comment that there is something special about this. I mean, it's special in the United States, but what's even more incredible is that this has turned into a global movement. We work with global entities, uh, some of them which are not headquartered in the United States, and they are finding themselves trying to figure out how to how to think about this. Um, so, and, and I would also say that there's faces, waves to this. And the first one, which was through June, which we sort of mostly kind of passed through, is this immediate reaction. This the uh, this demonstrations, protests, uh, and the way corporations and organizations are responding to that was trying to trying to articulate a stance about what this meant. But we're now in another phase, which is that um, now people are starting to say, okay, this was acknowledged, but what do we actually do? What do we have to do that is different going forward as organizations, as leaders? And the answers are wanting because one, one hasn't really spent a lot of time thinking about this. So let me, let me say two things. One about why I think we're in this moment right now. And the other, what the implications are um, for leaders as they are trying to grapple with how important is this for the success of an organization and how do I need to think about this going forward? Um, Why this particular moment in time? Uh, This has been building, I mean, for a long time. It's been building, it's been building. Um, You know, it wasn't... So so it wasn't like this is the first time that society has grappled with it. Correct. But I believe that there are, and this is a theory, so sociologists will probably look into this for many years, but there are two things in particular that really stood out. One was that we had the pandemic, which meant that people had the time to actually, we're so busy that like, when the new cycle is done, it's on to the next new cycle. And it could have been that way here as well. But no, we had the, uh, the, the ability to focus on this issue. Right. The first time. And the time to do it. That, I think, was huge. And, uh, and the second piece is the... It was from a the capturing a moment perspective. It was so blatant. It was so extreme. Yeah. That you, if you watched that and you couldn't be affected by it, uh, I think. Well, I think it was just difficult to do. Right. So, so, so those two things in concert was what raised the level of of uh, of, of awareness and and reactions. And then the third thing kicked in, which is what I've been waiting for for quite some time, which is for the first time, this wasn't just a black issue. Maybe people will just kind of say, yeah, yeah, I I support it. This was an issue, like if you look at who was demonstrating, if you look at the visual, Everyone. It was a very diverse group of people. Like Armenians protesting in Armenia. Right. There's not even any black people there. But they're saying <laughs> you're, 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 this it goes to something fundamental about who we are as humans. And yeah. so and so that's I think those those things, like the, the first two created it. And then the fact that people realized, wait a minute, everybody's kind of participating in this. This is the moment. This is the moment. And history moves through moments that I, I believe that there's, you know, uh, there, there, there's a windows of opportunity. If you're looking from the positive side or this transformative sort of moments. And what happened here is that 
it didn't end up just being a moment. I, I talked about, I did a little piece that I talked about going from a moment to a movement, going from a moment to a movement. And this was able to make that leap. So first of all, because it made a leap into a movement, unlike these other times, this clearly isn't going away. I've talked to, I don't know how many CEOs over the past three, four weeks. And every conversation that I've had have been, it, for some, it could have been about the, uh, about the short term, but for everybody, everybody, whether they were worried about the short term or not, it was about the long term. So every conversation was about the long term. What is it structurally that we need to think about? Because I know I'm going to be called out on it. What has substantially changed? Because it's going to get called out. And we're yeah. seeing it already. CEOs are being ousted from companies where they go out saying, we support Black Lives Matter, but then their own employees are saying, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on, yeah. not go fast. You actually screwed this up internally. And it leads to viral what, Twitter. What's su super interesting. I mean, it's just such a complex, deep, meaningful topic. Yeah. There's so many systemic issues that led to not only the George Floyd moment, as so many before, and other things we nobody sees, but um, is uh, it's it's been such like I'm I'm really hoping that. A, it does last, that it persists, yes. that it's not just another so, you know, social media thing, the new cycle thing, and a trend. Yeah, I doubt that. Uh, I, I, hope you, I really hope you're right. And I feel a great amount of responsibility as a human, as a CEO of a company, to participate in ensuring that it persists and yeah. it gets interwoven in every fabric of what we do. Uh, but the other interesting thing to your point is like what it's also done, it's actually exposed both blatant racism, which yes. some people are racist and they behave a certain way. But it's also done is I'm not a racist used to be the acceptable <laughs> level of standards. <laughs> it's right. I'm, I'm not a racist okay I guess I can't prove that you are so you must be doing enough but now Franz is what I'm excited about this like the new standard is like the right thing is to be anti-racist up until about a month ago I can't recall corporate leaders even using the term anti-racist and it's precisely the, the point that you're racing right which is it isn't enough. It just isn't to say, look, I'm not contributing. The discussion of racism has gone from individual to systemic. And if it's mm -hmm. systemic, the question is, what am I able to do to impact the system? What can I do? And if I'm not doing something to impact the system, then I'm probably simply enabling it or, 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 or keeping it in place. It's not how do we avoid screwing up? It is, what can we do actively to progress? Level of self-awareness. And I've, I've said this, you know, in, in, in front of the company and to my family, I'm like, look, why, why is it acceptable to anyone <laughs> that being black in America is harder than any, being anything else? Why is that acceptable? Why are we like, well, I'm not actively racist. So yeah, after <laughs> hundreds of years, the lives of black men and women are in danger all the time, or there's no, e there's no equality of opportunity still to this That's day right. for this one particular type of our citizens. Again, if one, if I spend some time to think about it, it becomes obvious how prevalent it is, but I, I'll just share two examples. Um, so let's say the world of tech uh, and startups. There's a very, this, this tends to be a notion, right? That that's a world we're kind of talking about. This is about, uh, this is a kind of equal opportunity and meritocracy. And you have to come up with a good idea and then you get funded. And, but all you have to do is break that down a little bit. And you start realizing just how flawed that assumption is. Who gets funded? Well, people that have spent some time, usually taking time off or significant time 
outside of work to work on an idea, maybe with some other folks, but they worked it up to a, a point that they can now sort of ask maybe for some, for some seed funding. And that seed funding gets them to the next stage. But who has time to take six months to kind of work on their idea? Like, who, what does that demographic look like? question I have for you is where this becomes really relevant to the commercial lifeblood yeah. of this country and the world and the applications of, of all of this. One of the things that struck out initially in, in your slides, and the one I clearly remember, <laughs> was you had the stepladder of like why diversity and inclusion yeah. and, and you can marry in that i think uh equality and opportunity i think it's ingrained in that yeah yeah why, why is that important you said look there's all these reasons oh it's a uh, state law requires one woman on your board if you're publicly traded in california okay that's like those kind of things or it's it's market uh, expectation or it's whatever but you had at the very top, you're like, this is like strategic. Yes. Right. Strategic advantage. The strategic advantage of diversity and inclusion is one. And how do we try that into mechanisms that can actively break cycles, whether they're poverty cycles or racism cycles or access to opportunity cycles? And what roles can we play in tech, in the Google Cloud ecosystem, in the oh, yeah. partner ecosystem? How do we actively participate? Because like we're like we're self-serving in that uh, we want to have the best ideas. We want to have um, the most innovation. We want to actually have access to talent that's beyond all the white males available who want to go into engineering. And I think because this market is growing so fast, and there's going to be so much job creation that. We have to access to, we have to tap into all pools of potential talent. And then to the extent that we can contribute very positively in breaking those cycles, which is by the way, what Rob Enslin said when I talked to him about this, he's a, you know, the president of Google Cloud, uh, grew up in South Africa, lived through apartheid, very unique experience. Yeah. And he's a big proponent of like, we have to tie in access to opportunity to the equation. Great point i think that slide does provoke a bit because what we have at number three so it's a five point slide and number three we have is the right thing to do correct correct uh and this is the right thing to do it's just correct. that in our experience if you're looking to make an impact at a corporate level in a company uh <laughs> that'll only take you so far because the what a company is the prime reason for a company's existence um, you know, it has a vision, it has a mission, but it's always tied to business. It's always Especially tied to if you're large and publicly traded or have investors. Oh, yeah. Forces you cannot control. Like, look, do the right thing is one of our five core values. It's ingrained in SADA. But you, you can't be. say, I'm doing this, but it's a big disadvantage that I'm doing it and I'm losing money doing this. You can't. You have to, have, you have to get market share. You have to make profit. You have to increase your shareholder value. I mean, all these things are are just taken as a given. And so, so here's the key thing. If, the, if a company's or a team's effort to enhance DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, is separate from its goal to enhance its business outcomes, be seen as a complete parallel, I don't think it's long-term sustainable. It can sustain itself in the short term. I agree. So, like, anything can do that. But in the long term, between these two tracks, the business track will always win out. Every entity will run into challenges, either because it's being hit by a competitor or margins start contracting or it's not growing fast enough or whatever it is. But business challenges abound. And, if, and what I'm articulating right, is that DEI is going to help you achieve these business outcomes, these business goals. And they're going to help you do it faster better, more effectively. Now, the first order of business that we engage with clients is to ensure that there's an understanding that that is the case. That's why I think the talk, you were like, wow, what is he talking about? Yeah. <laughs> it's at, the, at the Cloud Summit. I've never heard somebody talk about this outside of the context of it's the right thing to do. It's our, we have to do it. People expect that we do it. Like, how do we get it so it's just like, of course, that's the right thing to do. You're going to lose 
if you don't do it. And so what we see with the teams that are on our platform is that whether or not they are even started because of the AI, maybe that wasn't even in the equation. They're like, we need to just be faster. We need to, we need to, we need to drive revenue growth. Put us on your platform, the Renaissance mm-hmm. platform. What happens? They start asking themselves, well, how can we get more diverse as a team? Now, why are they asking that question? Because they've been seeing the positive business outcomes of tapping into their diversity, mm-hmm. like being inclusive. There. And it follows that they say, are we as diverse as we could be? No, we're not. So now we have to start addressing that. And when you do that, other things start appearing. Because it turns out that sometimes it might be difficult to figure out who should be joining your team. Uh, and one big thing that we talk about now systemically uh, uh, or, or is this idea that organizations tend to be very focused and quite good at bringing talent to opportunity. Mm-hmm. Right? But not all talent is equally able to move or is centered around where, uh, where, where a company is located. So what COVID has shown us is that we can work virtually. And yeah. so should we flip it? Can we bring opportunity to talent? I mean, this is Clearly. I think we're much more capable of doing so. And if we can do that, we can all of a sudden begin to expand in a much more effective way, much more aggressively, who can be within sort of our team. What does that even mean? That's right. Uh, so this is one example of having the business, understanding from a business perspective, how a diverse and inclusive team will help you outperform. And we've seen this over and over and over again, like in a direct way. I'm talking about a team measurably within three to four months, seeing an improvement in their business outcomes because of the diversity and inclusive of their team. So that's the timeline I'm talking about, right? It happens yeah. quickly. What can we do to perhaps change the equation a little bit to make sure that the talent has, there's a bit more of an equal uh, access. Uh, and so for instance, flipping to opportunity to talent might be, might be the way to do it. That's just one, one suggestion. There's many others. Mm-hmm. But this intuitive understanding of that it drives business results becomes huge. And it's exciting because I think companies today are under far more pressure than ever to deliver results. I read a book called Essentialism. Uh, again, yeah. Rob Inslet yeah. referred to it at uh, their kickoff in January in Vegas. And this you know, theory that like amazing things that we can happen if we just are, you know, look at just what's, what's critical and essential. People often say yes to too many things and all this other stuff. Yeah, that's right. um, and then when COVID hit, I was like, oh my God, this is a period of forced essentialism yeah. where we have no choice but to be with our thoughts, be with our family, be home, uh, slow down, right? And you know, it's kind of both, right? It's been, hasn't it been, it seems like it's been both. Yes. Yes. Slow down, but speed up. I, I, I see, well, it was like four, four weeks of like, oh my God. And then things accelerated in certain sectors and other yeah. sectors, yes. not so much, but, but this requirement to be deeply rooted in our thoughts, Yes, which, which created the opportunity and, and to question everything, frankly, yes. right? That's right. To created the, uh, the, the George Floyd moment. And I think the opportunity ahead is to translate, to not miss this uh, chance to to do a bunch of short-term things, but also long-term things in creating equality and opportunity and diversity and inclusion. And what, I, what I'm challenged with is the long-term, yeah. which I believe is, yes, we can look at our current needs and, 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 uh, create more diverse teams of uh, yeah. hyper experience or middle tier experience or other types of people in different roles. But what I also want to be able to do is create a, a pipeline of talent from sources yes. that we never got talent from before. So that's a big one, right? And, and people are beginning to start, they're looking into that now. They're trying to figure out what that means. For their for their industry, their, their their sector, with all your clients, I mean, with 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 your company and 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 sort of the whole cloud ecosystem, it's it's one thing um, uh, about what that talent looks like. Um, then you have your 
your clients and they themselves are, mm-hmm. are, 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 are looking to address it. The thing that I think is true in, in all these cases, though, is that, number one, innovation will keep speeding up. The need for innovation will keep speeding up. Correct. Okay, so uh, number two, a fundamental driver of that is cloud. I mean, so it's not mm-hmm. the only thing, but that is like whenever you get into a real conversation about innovation and transformation, you're going to somewhere at some point, there's going to be a discussion around cloud that shows up. Mm-hmm. So so, so you and and everybody sort of in that is listening to this podcast are, are a part of that thinking. Um, but but there's still fierce competition within it. Everybody actually knows this is a huge opportunity. Totally. It's fierce yeah. competition. So to me, the question that one should be asking oneself in trying to think about the long term is, <clears throat> do I have an understanding in how diversity, and inclusion, and equity can help me in my positioning in the long term? And if I do, and if my people do, and my leadership does, then there will be more people more eagerly looking to address the topics that yeah. you're raising. It can't just be you, Tony, saying, I got to, I got to, sure. and like you're, you and, and the head of HR, let's solve yeah. the pipeline issue. What you want is people that, whose success in your organization, whose success depends upon continued speed and innovation and thinking more broadly about how do we engage our clients? How do we think about a partnership? How do we, like, how are we, how are we constructing this solution or migration or whatever it is that we need to do? I'm better off because I have more sort of diverse perspectives accessible to me. So I'm, this is a part, I need to help solve this issue as well. Right. Because when you have a different conversation, you can bring in more people uh, to solve for, for instance, the talent pipeline. Yeah. Um, uh, that that to me is is key because my my guess is that there are a very large number of people in your organization that are thinking about other issues, like say AI, <laughs> and it's going to be a lot yeah. of oh, yeah. thoughts, a lot of ideas about how to progress, how to innovate. The so boom. Okay. <laughs> uh, oh wow! I love it. This is great. Okay. These aren't just props. This is like, this is part of my reading list. But that's it. Well, you yeah. right there. That's that's the point I'm making. Yeah. I believe that leaders very easily understand the value of, of, of investing and educating themselves in AI, but they are struggling to understand the value of educating themselves on what it means to be an inclusive leader. 100%. 100%. Look, this is... I hope that our work together continues. I know that yes. you're busier now than ever. I want to investigate and study the platform because I think it's a gift to the world that you're launching because there's just not enough of you and your team to go around. And, uh, you know, I, I, want to, I want to continue to be between the Medici group and Sada. I want to be partners in this journey for a very long period of time. And you can lean on me for anything. And we have a lot of things that we're going to continue to do that, frankly, in a very self-aware way, we haven't done enough yeah. on the topic of, of racism and, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. We were getting better on the issue of women in technology. Yeah. And look, the, the, the small strides we've made have had, I think, exponential impact on the company. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Because it's just amazing. Like, you know, uh, so many of our leaders coming into the company, uh, being more representative. Again, yeah. part of it is like, hey, if we don't have more women entering the enterprise software space, whether it's sales or marketing or engineering, we'll never have enough talent That's right. to address the global market. That's half the population of the world. <laughs> 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 um, but if we don't tap into... Uh, a pipeline of talent that we can also groom. Look, some of the best talent Sana has, has today is the ones we've homegrown. Sure. And we were incidental about it. We were accidental about it. It was just like, well, we could only afford junior folks back in the days, 10 years ago, five years ago. And they grew up with Sana. They became the best in the world at what they do. But being deliberate about that pipeline. Yeah. So and it's that's reaching into pipeline. the neighborhood and the communities. Uh, we actually launched Sada University with two students today. Oh, wow. Which takes two very junior level 
engineers, well paid at SADA, like we pay we pay them in this three month period where they go through a SADA university boot camp and then get hired by one of the teams. And I hope that sometime next year we have um, people of all backgrounds that yeah. normally are unrepresented. Uh, we are forming a partnership with Nesby. Yeah. Just want to tap into that talent pool and that yeah. partnership with all the black engineers who are part of that organization. Yeah. And I have, have, a, have a composite talent pool that we're tapping into because I know deep down in my heart that it's more than the right thing to do that it is the future and it is on the right side of history and, and it's going to give us the biggest market advantage possible. I know that for a fact. I think that this is the, the most important issue that companies face because there are two things that are intersecting. You mentioned both of them. It's this need to innovate, to deliver, to grow. And it's diversity and inclusion as a society, but the implications that has on organizations. And that's why I believe that the, what we do is, um, is incredibly important. And why so working cool. with leaders like yourself is critical because it does require, even though this is the need, it still requires vision to actually see where we're heading. Uh, so thank you. No, my pleasure. Thanks for being a mentor, someone I can look to and admire on the topic and to to always be willing to to talk and, and, and share ideas. I really appreciate it and uh, your inspiration to me and hundreds of other companies that you work with. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> I appreciate that. And thanks for this. This is a great conversation. Thank you for listening to Cloud and Clear. Check the show notes for links to this week's topics. And don't forget to connect with us on Twitter at Cloud and Clear and our website, sada.com. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app.